Good evening and welcome to the fourth webinar in our new series for education professionals, Handwriting and Tourette Syndrome, Common Issues that Impact Learning. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Manager, and I will be your moderator this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During the webinar, we'd be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using, using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. This webinar has been accredited for one contact hour for psychologists and social workers. For more information on how to claim your credit, please download the learner notification document that is located in the handouts section of the control panel. In order to receive a certificate, you must participate in the entire webinar and follow the instructions on that document. You will also receive a follow-up email within the hour after the webinar closes with the detailed instructions on where to go to take the survey and claim your credit. Also in the handout section, there is a copy of the slides along with a few of the TAA's educational toolkits that you may download. Before we get started, I want to briefly introduce our speaker this evening, Margaret Henning. She has over 25 years of experience in pediatric OT, initially as an OTA and now as an OTR after er earning her BS slash MS in OT from the State University of New York at Buffalo. She conducts frequent in-services regarding the efficacy of occupational therapy for individuals with Tourette and related neurological conditions at the local, state, regional, and national Tourette conferences, as well as for the Niagara Frontier District OT Association. She's been involved with transition services and has presented on programs for adolescents with dual diagnoses. Marjorie serves as the chairman of the board of the Tourette Syndrome Association of Western New York and currently serves on the National Tourette Association of America Educational Advisory Committee. She has two adult sons, a grandson, and several extended family members living with TS and related disorders. She is currently in private practice and previously worked at University of Buffalo Center for Assistive Technology. Thanks so much for being here this evening and without further ado, please go ahead with your presentation. Thanks, Angela. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, so obviously we're gonna be talking about handwriting issues, which um, we all have. Um, so jumping right in um, and very quickly, uh, these are our learning objectives. We're gonna talk about what contributes to difficulties that individuals with TS have with handwriting. We'll talk about accommodations that we can put in place to help students with handwriting issues present information to show what they know. Um, and then um, also touch on why um, standard uh, mm -hmm. occupational therapy observations are um, not enough to, um, uh, that we need to go beyond what a standard OT um, evaluation is that we need to delve into uh, you know clinical observation um, and uh, methods to help students with Tourette. So thank you many of you um, um, responded to my questionnaire about you know who is going to be participating tonight and I got some good responses and a couple of them um, I was able to add, and a few of them that I got in later today, I wasn't able to add, um, and I hope I might be able to refer to them later. But um, very quickly, we've got a variety of, you know, I mean, obviously there's more people, but um, somebody that's working in a private OT clinic who um, is working with an eight-year-old and looking for information regarding an OT's role in assessing and treating fine motor and handwriting issues. Um, a, a 
public school gifted and talented teacher who's working with a seven-year-old first grader, which is really awesome. Um, the mother of a 13-year-old, this mom won the trifecta. She's got an eighth grader um, who's been receiving OT services through the school. Um, and she'd like to get you know more information on what they can do at school and at home to help with handwriting. And she has a 16-year-old um, senior in high school and a husband um, who also have Tourette. And um, a support group leader who um, advocates, works with them, parents to advocate for children, assist them with 504 and the IEP processes. And she once a month attends um, TS clinics at their local children's hospital to meet newly diagnosed um, families and begin the, the voyage that is going to last a lifetime. Then there's the mom of a 14 year old high school sophomore and um, this is an interesting comment that she sees the disconnect between neurology or the doctors and occupational therapy as far as handwriting goes. And the, the thing that, that I thought of was it's interesting that, well, it's just comical that, um, gosh, maybe doctors don't recognize the problem that kids have with handwriting because they have problems with handwriting themselves. But, um, all joking aside, um, you know, she'd love to know, um, you know, how we can put this all together um, and um, what are the issues, um, you know, that we can um, address with handwriting issues. So right now they're using a computer, which they've been doing since fourth grade, but she would like to see handwriting addressed. And I do strongly um, support that. And before I forget, and I will forget, um, the one handwriting program that I really, really like, and it's not, I, it's Mary Benbow's um, Loops and Other Groups. It's a um, kinesthetic program, and I know it's not used very much, uh, but for a variety of reasons, that's the one that I I like. Um, then there's a um, COTA mom who's working with her son, and he's a he's a younger guy. Um, and this is very typical, though, of um, many of our uh, little guys with Tourette. I mean, everybody with Tourette, as the symptoms wax and wane, um, he has a handwriting tick that, um, when it when it's active, he has trouble with writing. Um, so he overwrites words, he erases, he writes it repeatedly, he makes hash marks on the paper, and they found that the technology to be very helpful um, or scribing when the tick is really bad. Um, and that's the thing that, you know, we, we want to give our, our kids the tools to um, use when they need them, but to keep learning um, the handwriting and in the, in this when I'm talking handwriting I'm talking cursive handwriting but we want them to learn um, letter formation and um, getting their thoughts on paper um, in in addition then using the technology when they need it um, and in this instance she's found the teacher to be very accommodating the one of the next ones you'll see um, it isn't always that great. This is a copy of um, the paper that, that this first grader did. Um, and you can see that she used snap type, which, which I recommend, it's especially useful for younger kids. So he began this worksheet in school, and this is the area that he began in school. You can see that, um, you know, difficulty with um, his letter formation, capitalization, getting things um, formed, um, spacing within in the limited amount of area that they're given to write in and his um, um, spacing and then, you know, trying to fit his information wherever he can. And then once they, you know, did the snap type and he's able to type his information um, at home, look at the difference in what he can put on the page uh, with the with the with the um, keyboard. So 
you know, if you looked at this, this doesn't look like um, there's a whole lot of information coming out. Um, and then when you look at this, these are these are big words. Mary discovered the fossilized skeleton of an animal that, and then he he mistyped this. It should be no one had ever seen before. Um, but this is an excellent example of what technology can do as opposed to when we expect our kids to just um, do what everybody else is expected to do. This is um, this is a lengthy re had um, some struggles because um, they've tried some different um, papers. Handwriting without tears is one of them. Graph paper. They've highlighted the bottom line. Um, using highlighting a dot where the sentence is supposed to begin. So he's got difficulties with, you know, spacing, um, letter formation, getting things, you know, where they belong on the paper. But the issue is he won't, at home he uses this and it works great. He won't use it at school and we've, we see this a lot. Um, and for a variety of reasons and, um, this mom speaks to the the um, impact it has on on him, um, you know his anxiety, his need to follow the rules. He also has a need not to be different, which that's all kids. Um, and given the fact that he has Tourette, and he already feels probably um, like he's different. Um, to add another piece. And, uh, you know, I need my special paper. I need to do this differently than the rest of the class. He's just having a hard time with that. So um, also the teacher isn't um, encouraging him to do uh, what has been put in place for him. So he really struggles with getting um, information um, on paper and getting things done in the classroom. Um, they've been using talks talk to text, but the issues with that are, uh, you know, grammar and punctuation are not um, a part of that, and also uh, things get misinterpreted um, with the um, dictation, so there's problems with what's actually being dictated, and, um, you know, there's the problem with now that the student isn't learning proper um, grammar and punctuation. So is he being graded strictly on the, the content or is he being graded on um, grammar and punctuation and spelling? So those issues are, they need to be addressed and, and those um, skills are lagging. So something needs to, to happen to um, support this child's learning. He's also, um, Try typing, the district doesn't teach typing. Um, there's an, um, a problem with the OT, um, doesn't teach typing. They can't seem to get the, um, the support that they want there. And they have a 504 in place. Um, so, um, and then they, you know, mom talks about cursive and this is the, the wonderful part is that she does believe that once he's mastered cursive, um, he'll be able to get his assignments done. Um, so the questions, and these are gonna be covered, um, what type of medical professional diagnosis dysgraphia? How can a student get OT support in school from a district that claims the OTs in the district have no services to offer a student with dysgraphia? And are there other tools or accommodations we should be looking into? Um, and very quickly um, on that, um, I know that if if it's dysgraphia, so he needs to be diagnosed with dysgraphia first. Um, usually, it's a um, a neuropsychologist, neuropsychologist, a um, 
a psychologist that has been certified and um, is qualified to give all of the tests required um, to diagnose dysgraphia. Um, and um, dysgraphia itself would be something that needs to be addressed really um, kind of by a whole team, but there, there are things that an OT can do to um, support those issues. And we'll talk about the other tools that can be used. So this, these are copies of the papers that um, that Mom has sent along. So looking at these, these are things that he's he's doing at a you know the end of a, a fourth grade year, a ten year old, um, and obviously this is not a representative of what he knows, um, and. We do need to look at what uh, what other things can be done to help this this student. So there's many factors that interfere with writing as far as the, our students with Tourette go. Um, obviously ticks, and then because of the ticks, um, and aside from the ticks, you'll have finger and hand cramping, arm, neck, and shoulder cramping because. Um, you're trying to hold things very steady um, to get things on paper that are legible. Um, there's some fine motor coordination and control. There can also be additional developmental delays. And then um, the new and improved um, uh, DSM-5 um, diagnosis for um, learning disorders uh, is the um, Specific learning disorders for written expression, which used to be known as dys, um, dysgraphia. Um, in the impairment in mathematics was dyscalculia. And then the impairment in reading uh, was um, dys, um, dyslexia. So and we still refer to them that way, and you'll hear me talk about those. But the official terminology are those, and that's what is used to qualify for um, a learning disability. I, I'm sure that you have all seen these, this um, this famous um, iceberg, but it's important for all of us to understand that when when we're working with our our children with Tourette, whether it's it's our own children, whether it's you know in the school system or in the private setting, all of these things. It really is the concept of the, the unseen part of the iceberg. And normally the iceberg, um, it's not kind of tidy underneath here, but it it's way out here, um, you know, so that you're going to bump, I mean, the ships will bump into these issues more out here long before you get into the, this part. But anyway, I digress. Um, what what we need to remember is these are kind of all of the quiet things um, that are just simmering under the surface, so to speak. And uh, for our children, they they are the the big issues, and they always feed off of each other as well. So that um, they have attention problems and. Um, then they're trying to write something, and then um, you know the OCD kicks in, so that the the handwriting doesn't look quite right. But then they can't remember what it was they were supposed to be doing. But then, you know, the kids are you know um, socially they you know they're making fun of them, and then their anxiety kicks in, and then oh my gosh, we start having behavioral problems, and then we go into a rage. So um, you can see where. All of these things can feed off of each other and create more issues um, for our for our kids with Tourette. So we just talked about some of those negative behaviors and um, some of the the things you know the OCD can greatly interfere with um, writing um, and they can. Um, interfere with being able to focus on the task at hand uh, 
or there's things going on in their head that they're thinking about that may have happened before school they're going to happen um, later something that's happening in the classroom right now that somebody did or said or uh, you know it has and then they need to do this so many times just right or something is going to happen or it has to be just perfect and they've got to get things lined up and set just right many times projects or anything that has to be done um, they will rehearse it in their head and do it over and over and over in their head creating the finished project to perfection or trying to work it out to perfection so that it becomes so monumental that they can't even start it so sometimes um you know i will tell kids just you know um they don't even know where to begin uh, like on a writing assignment i'll say just give me a sentence just write anything put anything on paper it doesn't have to be the opening statement it doesn't have to be your thesis statement just give me some words let's put some words on the paper um and from there then you can maybe start pulling um you know they can start generating some stuff and then you can start moving things around and that might be where mind map or um yeah mind mapping comes in sleep hygiene is an issue for these kids medication side effects um and then i i double dipped on um add anxiety and sensory as you'll see on my next slide there it is again um but then we'll also talk about um and i talked about it on the iceberg thing but executive dysfunction there uh, i will talk about it on the next slide and um sensory processing and then the learning disabilities of um specifically you know dyscalculia dysgraphia and dyslexia that also um interfere with with kids writing so it seems to be a small thing and of course if it's not hitting your radar it it doesn't exist um but smells um i i smell a lot of things that my husband doesn't smell and um is it, you know um sometimes that's a problem um but for kids if you think about in a classroom um environmental smells depending on where the where the school is it can be you know a, a farming community it can be a um near an industrial complex it can be um who knows where um but also then cooking smells coming from um, the cafeteria. Uh, maybe the dumpster is outside their their room. Uh, maybe smells from um, you know somebody's snack that they're eating is is you know too pungent. Um, a perfume that the teacher is wearing, although hopefully they don't do that anymore. Um, marker smells, the smell of paper or crayons. There's so many things that it doesn't hit our radar, but it hits, you know, somebody that is very sensitive to, to smell. I hate going to somebody's house um, when they have, when they've lit all of their, their beautiful smelling candles, because it just gives me a horrible headache and I can't stand it. And it's hard to socialize when, you got to smell their pretty candles. Um, so anyway, come up with something, a smell that they can um, enjoy or um, block out, um, something that's calming to them, and figure out a way for them to, to use that. Put it on their sleeve, on their arm. Um, put it on a, you know, a bracelet or cotton balls or um, a sachet that, you know, it could be a weighted thing that they have on their desk or in their desk. So come up with some clever ways to put some scented things somewhere that they have access to. For sounds, um, canceling out sounds that are um, difficult for them. Um, a really um, cool thing are, they're called open ear wireless bone conduction headphones. So it sits on the, um, bones in front of the ear so it doesn't block the ear you still hear everything that's going on 
but you're hearing whatever is coming through the headphones as well, and that can block out the the disturbing sounds, so to speak. Um, and you could also use um, white noise um, or um, you know sound canceling headphones or um, earbuds, and um, you could also try belly breathing, which they could make their own little sound um, and incorporate some calming uh, for themselves. For lights, um, you know, sunglasses, tinted lenses, visors, ball caps, change to incandescent lights in the room. I had a special ed teacher who brought in all um, lights from, um, you know, regular um, home lighting and turned off the classroom lights and it was a very calming, warm learning environment, which was comfortable for everybody that came in. And if worse comes to worse, teach them how to shield their eyes with their non-dominant hand and anchor their work on a clipboard um, in order to work. Um, you know, and with, if people have issues with you know, wearing um, visors or ball caps in a classroom because we must have rules about these things, um, make it um, a, a something that's normal for the whole class, um, such as um, if we if we want to, if we choose to, we all have our thinking caps, and we'll put our thinking caps on while we're working, if we need to put on our thinking caps. And it can be a classroom, you know, you can get them cheap for the whole class. Um, on the internet and they can decorate them, they can make them special uh, and it, it makes it normal for the whole class. Um, for textures, some people have problems with the things um, while they're writing. So some sort of a glove that they can wear that might um, alleviate some of that problem um, or slipping a piece of a preferred fabric um, between their hand and the surface might might help. Um, but exploring, if you talk with the child, what is it that um, is bothersome to you? And be ready to just listen and take it in and try to come up with some solutions rather than, oh, that's weird or that doesn't bother me. Um, that's not going to be helpful. Executive functioning skills are a big part of um, a lot of uh, our handwriting and um, life in general. And a lot of our kids with Tourette have um, difficulties with pieces of executive function. So I um, will encourage you to um, familiar, familiarize yourself with um, the executive function. Um, and on the next slide, um, we'll talk about that. But there's aspects of, you know, goal-directed thinking skills, so planning and prioritizing. This is, you know, planning how to form a letter, how to form um, words, how to, um, you know, organize your, your letters on the paper, your words on the paper, how to organize your um, uh, materials, how to um, manage your time to get things done, how to remember um, you know, math facts, how to remember spelling, grammar, and punctuation, how to remember how to form the letters, um, how to um, analyze or, you know, think about your thought processes. What are you, um, what do you need to do to correct the problem that you're having? And then your behavior skills, um, um, you know, can you can you delay your response until you um, you know can you stop blurting out? Can you wait until the teacher's done before you you know ask to go to the bathroom or ask the question or make a silly silly remark? Um, can you um, keep yourself calm in your seat? Can you fidget or do something to um, help you focus while you need to sit still? Do you need to get up and walk around? Do you need to go get a drink of water? Um, can you get started on, on the task that you have to do? Um, can you switch gears when things aren't working right or when um, there's a change in plans, when there's a substitute teacher, when there's um, you know um, something that changes the schedule? Are you able to go with the flow? And 
can you um, see something through on, until the, it's finished? So those are all pieces of executive function from, you know, um, large to small, um, from writing a simple letter to, you know, gosh, writing a dissertation. Um, so accommodations for executive functions, these aren't uh, by all means, um, you know, the whole thing. But my biggest, my biggest, biggest thing is get yourself um, a copy of, um, and I don't get money for this, <laughs> Dawson and Guar's, um Executive Function Skills for Children and Adolescents, I think is really, really good, really helpful. It explains all of those um, aspects that I just talked about. And um, also, I found through working with um, in the schools and working with our kids with Tourette, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So chances are um, you or a family member um, may also have some aspects of executive function skills that might need um, a little tweaking. Um, also um, use um, a big desk or wall calendar to help plan um, long-term assignments in manageable chunks and do your backward planning on that. So you put the due date on the calendar and then backward plan from that day so that, you know, it's it's finished the day before or two days before and then the sloppy copy is done the day before that and um, divide up the work a little at a time so that um, from the day it's assigned, you've got little chunks of work that are done you know, in small increments um, and nothing becomes um, insurmountable. Also, there's apps that you can use um, and um, calendar reminders um, to keep track of subjects and tasks and commitments. Um, apps uh, or um, apps that use a mind mapping um, to develop and organize your writing assignments are very helpful. Using a timer for um, especially younger people or or even big people who just have a, a hard time getting started on something because it just seems so big that they're never going to get it done. Just say, I'm going to work on this for 10 minutes and then I'll put it away or I'll be done with it. And if you do that, chances are you can work beyond that or it's just, I'll see how much of this I can get done in 10 minutes. Um, so sometimes, you know, that is enough to get you going. Um, I had a little guy who was really having trouble getting his homework done in second grade and there were tears and carrying on and the mom was insisting that he needed, you know, more services in school because he wasn't able to do his homework at home. And what we did, the teacher wrote on each worksheet how much time she expected him to take to complete a worksheet. And then mom set the timer for that amount of time. And he was to work on it for that amount of time. And when the timer went off, he was to put it in his book bag and be done with it. And what happened was he was able to, and then if he finished beforehand, mom was to write down how much time it took him. Well, obviously he was able to finish before time and that ended the the homework you know battles it was it was just so monumental to him um beforehand but then putting that in there gave him um the freedom i guess um you know he was able to get it done see that he had control over it and he was able to get his homework done and go out and play and be a kid um and then I can't, I can't recommend enough how much physical exercise is a really good thing to do while um, you're also um, trying to um, get other things into your brain because it opens other channels um, laying down tracks in the brain um, while you're reading um, or listening to recorded lectures or books on tape. So walking, biking, um, or even, you know, if you're sitting and um, listening and coloring, painting, or doing something with your hands um, can actually help you to um, focus on what you're listening to. So 
Now, dysgraphia, these are things you'll see down here at the bottom. I've, I I've taken this from um, understood.org, which is an excellent resource that I recommend. Um, and these are some of the things that they um, suggest as um, possible things you would see as um, symptoms of dysgraphia. And what you need to understand is that um, if you're seeing these, some of these symptoms, I think the, the best, what I would recommend, um, first of all, is open a conversation with your doctor. And obviously, um, you know, if, if you're a parent of a child with, with Tourette, I would talk to the doctor that's treating the Tourette. But, um, you know, go with these things. Take some writing samples in. Um, take work samples. Um, show the doctor um, what the little guy is um, having trouble with and um, request um, help getting um, an evaluation for, for dysgraphia. Um, it isn't, um, I'll talk about the, the evaluation. It needs to be done by um, a psychologist psychologist or neuropsychologist, someone that is um, qualified um, and certified to give um, the battery of, of tests. And it needs to be, um, it should be, um, a dysgraphia evaluation should be part of a, of a very complete evaluation. It shouldn't be done in isolation. So you know, it has to be part of a, of a, it has to include an IQ exam, such as a WISC. Um, it really should include um, an executive function exam, um, such as um, the brief Barclays evaluation. Um, um, and then there would be a fine motor skills exam and OTs can assist with parts of, um, of this um, evaluation. And then handwriting ex um, samples are um, examined using parts of the other other portions of, of this evaluation, which are taken from the mechanics of writing. Um, and one of them is, you know, the test of writing of written language, which is the towel. There's others, or, or and then the thematics um, a writing test. So. Um, all of those things need to be um, evaluated and um, scrutinized and, and looked at um, to come up with the um, diagnosis for dysgraphia. Um, so those are, that is how you get the diagnosis for dysgraphia. And then um, hopefully you can take that to the school and um, and this, there may be people in the school that are qualified to give all of those um, tests and come back with the um, diagnosis. What you need to remember is that, and it, um, you can see from evaluations, um, when we evaluate younger kids, we might not see such a huge gap between what they're doing and what their peers are doing because in the lower grades, they're all learning how to how to write, how to you know all their fine motor skills. They're just learning these things. Um, they're just learning how to read. So they learn how to read and how to write in the lower grades, and um, their their inability um, to learn those things is disguised by their intelligence. They're able to cover up by what they know already. But then as they get into the higher grades where they need to use reading and writing um, to learn, that's when things start to fall apart and the gap widens um, between them and their peers. And then their what they know is um, they're, they're not able to show that on paper. So um, their intelligence is being disguised by their disability. So that's where we need to um, step up 
and advocate for figuring out, you know, what can we do to make sure that this child does not fall through the cracks, does not decide in 10th grade that, you know, they've had enough and they're going to, you know, um, start hanging out with the wrong crowd, they're going to drop out, they're going to give up on themselves and everybody else. Um, they have a lot of potential and we need to make sure uh, that we're there uh, to support them. So when we do an OT evaluation, um, here's, here's the problem, um, you know, with a standard evaluation, if you look at um, and all evaluations really, but OT in particular, we're testing in under optimum conditions, right? It's, um, it's a structured evaluation, it's closed-ended. We're directing um, the activities. Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. It's short duration. They, um, they don't have to generate any um, ideas really uh, you know, we can evaluate their handwriting, um, you know, we can ask them to write the alphabet and stuff like that or their, you know, name, address, and there, there's the handwriting um, evaluations that we can do. But pretty much uh, it's, it's a short-lived test. And what we really need to look at are, um, you know, what's going on in this child's life. So why why are they being referred for an evaluation? And what we really need to look at is their, um, their work product. Um, look at long-term over, um, over a long period of time um, from multiple subjects, um, favored subjects and unfavored subjects. What does the work product look like? Is it, you know, incomplete? Is it immature as far as, you know, their grade level? Is it legible or illegible? And is it fluctuating? Um, do you see it change, um, you know, um, from, from throughout pe periods of time? Are they able to pay attention to the task? And m m importantly, are, there, are you finding that there's inconsistent reports about their behavior or the work that they're um, they're doing between school and home, which is um, very common, or between different subjects, different teachers, different times of the day or days of the week. Um, all of those things are um, very common. Uh, the, the most common one is, and this was the one that the doctor, uh, the neurologist, told me when our when our son was first diagnosed, ask the teacher if she's hearing or seeing these things in school because what we were seeing and hearing at home was really concerning. And he said, if she's not hearing or seeing these things at school and you're seeing it at home, it's probably Tourette. And the reason being, Number one, they do these things where they're more comfortable. Um, so during in school, they're they're suppressing everything they can, um, you know, their tics and everything else. And while they're doing that, there is no learning going on at all. And then by the time they get home, they just let loose. And expecting them to do written work um, or homework of any kind is not going to happen. So you can see where um, that creates a big problem. Um, so those are things to really get to the bottom of and you need to talk to everybody that's involved in working with the with the student. Um, I can't support enough the you know the support staff um, and the special area teachers, um, art, music, gym, the librarian, um, find out how the how the student is functioning in all of those areas and then get a picture of the whole child and what are his strengths, what are his areas of need. Um, this is a copy of um, a worksheet that we would use when we were doing an evaluation 
um, for assistive technology. And we would talk to the, the teachers involved and we would, you know, um, ask about, you know, each subject, what, what, the, um, what the expected um, tasks were and how those things were being performed and then what, what the difficulties were. So we were able to then um, target areas that we were going to look at and um, try out different assistive technology uh, to see if those were things that might uh, make life easier. So those are, this is kind of an example of something that you could do to, you know, um, for OTs to look at um, specifically each classroom, find out what is he, what is he expected to be doing? What is he doing? And what do we think the problem is? And that very quickly will help you come up with some creative ideas for what's going to help this child um, learn and show what he knows. So um, we can skip over um, this. I mean, we know what, you know, uh, occupation. Uh, well, I think it's important to talk about, you know, an occupational profile um, and look at at the whole child, um, how they spend, you know, interview the mom, the parent, the, the school, um, but really get a picture of the whole child from school and home. And um, you'll see one of the, the more important things I look at is their schedule for a weekday and a weekend, and particularly how much time are they spending um, socializing and screen time and find out how much how much physical activity are they getting because we need to remember that there has to be a balance of those things and chances are um, as with most kids there's way too much screen time and we got to figure out a way to get get past that especially if we're going to be recommending assistive technology for these kids which is like we're shooting, shooting ourselves in the foot um, yeah, don't spend so much time on those, you know, handheld devices, but here, do this, do your homework on this. So we need to create a balance. <clears throat> um, and then I talked about, you know, people that you need to interview, looking at the samples and, and um, checking out how, what is the occupational performance that the student is, is doing in all areas of his life at school. Um, this is my soapbox. Um, I, re I strongly, strongly advocate for both cursive and accommodations. Um, years ago, when I first started, um, I was doing a presentation on um, the, the efficacy of um, occupational therapy for students with Tourette, and a parent interrupted um, the presentation because um, he was he was looking for a definitive um, opinion on handwriting. He had kids that were really struggling with handwriting, and the school was not willing to um, give in to um, assistive technology. And he wanted me to say, "Yeah, throw out the handwriting and go with the computer." Um, and I was trying to to say that. You know, cursive, and we'll come back to this, but cursive is really important because it lays down a motor memory that becomes um, an automatic, um, and it um, triggers different parts of the brain, um, and it actually um, helps with learning. So it's really important that we teach cursive. Before I talked about Mary Benbow is is my go-to person, um, but also um, we do need to do the accommodations, so we need to, there needs to be a set amount of time um, for teaching cursive. It needs to be practiced daily um, for more than 20 minutes a day, and it's just rote practice, 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 and when there is um, information that needs to be given or 
recorded, um, then we go to the accommodations until, you know, um, until or if um, we can um, get the handwriting down pat. But there's, there's room for both. Um, I am going to uh, probably slip past most of these things. Um, but um, these are the low-tech accommodations for dysgraphia or all kinds of, um, you know, writing problems. But the, um, you know, try different um, positions, you know, let them lay on their stomach and um, use a slant board. Um, and um, the other one is, you know, using a slant board or a binder and especially a, like a wider, um, like a three or four inch binder. And you lay that with the, the ring side facing away from the child and, um, you know, so it makes a slant um, toward the child. And then um, you can, um, that works as a slant board for them. They can lay on their stomach or it can be on their, on their desk and that helps support their arm. Um, weighted pencils, you can make your own weighted pencils. Um, take your pens or pencils to the hardware store, find some little O-rings that slide, that fit tightly on the pencil and find some washers. Um, so you put on an O-ring, you slide a couple washers on, slide another O-ring on and voila, you have weighted pens and pencils. I also would, I would love, uh, people to try um, going back to using fountain pens, um, which are really classy. I think kids would have um, feel special with them, even if you used them at home. But it is a different, um, you don't need as much pressure. Um, they move more smoothly on the paper and it might actually, they might enjoy um, learning cursive that way. These are assistive tech, tech things for dysgraphia. Um, and on the next page, there will be some others. I talk, I have always recommended um, the um, smart pen. That LiveScribe was bought out by a Canadian company recently, and I don't think you can find um, an Echo smart pen anymore. Um, I've seen some advertised on the internet for six or seven hundred dollars. You don't want to go there. They're only, you know, they were selling for like a hundred dollars. So, um, but the Symphony Smart Pen is um, another generation of that, and that is worth looking into. Um, that is really helpful for um, getting information down and. Um, it's useful for, you know, especially students with anxiety and OCD because it's what the smart pen does is it records the information. There's a digital recorder. So it's recording the information um, while you're taking notes and you don't need to take, you don't need to write down all the information because it's recording the information. And then you can go back later and um, you know, either fill in or delete information. Um, go online and look at, um, you know, watch the videos for how that works. Also, um, watch a video on um, Sonicent Audio, which is a higher level um, for, um, that's more geared for um, high school and college level, which is a really slick um, program. Um, which I would recommend. And then Read and Write Gold is a, is a complete package. Um, and that you can get a free 30 day uh, trial download, which you might find um, very useful. Mod Math and Snap Type are free. And um, I would um, recommend those as well. This is um, once again from my favorite, understood understood org and it is their list of the 11 apps um they're current currently there are 11 apps um, to help kids with note taking and you'll see um a few of those i've already talked about but they're worth um you know you can go go to that link and then um it will um you can look at each one of those um that they've shown there 
Um, these are other ideas for things that you can do um, to help kids, you know, show what they know. This is a um, study that's being done by Jan Rao, um, and it's on handwriting. And um, I also need to recommend that you look at her, uh, go to the Tourette.org website and to the, um, the recent um, conference and go to her handwriting um, presentation because she discusses um, the need for teaching um, handwriting and she has some good um, uh, research uh, references to back that up and also Heather Simpson um, and I've given those references as well um, for you to look at information. And here's the resources for um, uh, Dr. Rao and Dr. Rao and um, Smart Pen uh, information. And those are my references. And this is my contact information. So um, obviously, I'm, I'm sure I didn't cover everything. I've missed a lot, but you please feel free to contact me. Um, you can text, email. Um, call and I will be happy to um, talk with you one-on-one -on -one and work with you so thank you Angela take it away awesome thank you so much Margie um, that was a great presentation lots of helpful information for those of you on um, so as she may have mentioned, we're going to answer some questions that were submitted during the presentation. If you still have questions, feel free to submit them through the questions pane in the control panel. Um, if we don't get to everyone's questions, we will reach out to you after the fact um, and get the answers to your questions. And you can always reach out to Margie directly, as she mentioned. Um, we do have a full-time information and referral staff at the TAA who would be more than happy to help. Um, and you can email them at support at Tourette.org or give us a call at 1-888-4-Tourette. Okay, Margie, um, I have one question for you here. Um, it's kind of a long one, so let me know if you need me to repeat anything. So my kindergarten son has nice handwriting. His teacher says it resembles handwriting you'd expect in second grade. However, he can take hours to start a writing assignment, even when he needs just a cup just to copy a few words on <laughs> he reads at the first grade level do you think the difficulty getting started could be a handwriting issue related to the mechanics of handwriting or or another suggestion we're new to the diagnosis and i'm wondering how best to help him hmm well there's one um so if he has really good handwriting but he he has um, refresh my memory. But he has trouble getting started copying. Yes, and it is it's the copying that he's having trouble with. Uh, yes. So he has nice handwriting. It can take hours to start a writing assignment, even when he just needs to copy a few words onto paper. Um, he does read really well, um, and she's wondering if the difficulty could be a handwriting issue um, related to the mechanics of handwriting or something else. So, um, I'd have to I'd have to look at a couple of things, but my my first my first inclination is, and and I'm I might be wrong. Um, there might be an issue with his ability to copy, which is, you know, near point, far point. Um, but I'm, that means I'm focusing totally on, on the copying. Um, and I suspect that's not the only time I, um, so I guess I would suggest that mom experiment a little bit with with having him um, try copying some things near point, far point, to see if that's if that's what the issue is, and by near point, far point, I would try, you know, on a um, 
on a, a board at home or you know put a piece of paper up um and have him sit at the table and have him look up and copy it you know onto his paper and then try putting it just in front of him on his on his desk so that it's just you know on the table in front of him and he just has to copy a shorter distance and see see if she sees any difference and she could try it with maybe some random drawings as well just um random geometric figures um and put them on um the page in different areas and see if he's able to kind of um spatially um get things where they need to be but the other issue is um you know if it's not if it's not that um and so if it is that then um she would need to maybe pursue um you know visual um visual assessment as far as um you know his visual skills um or focus you know for near point far point and accommodation um but the other issue then is is he having is he having trouble getting started doing it um and i i guess i would i would ask him <laughs> i guess that would be my thing um I, I met a, I guess I, I am so sorry I'm at a loss and I'm gonna have to sue about that. But I can, you have her information so I can get back to you. Is that correct, Angela? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. We have a few more questions we'll take. Okay. Do you have a suggestion on getting a school OT on board with working on cursive? Our OT goal was just for being able to sign his name. They do not want to work on any other cursive. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would, I would say, um, you might try seeing if you could generate enough interest in the district level to to see if they would start maybe a handwriting club um because it, i know it, it's really hard ot's don't want to be known as the handwriting people but we are the handwriting people um the hands are what we do um and we we should do handwriting and yet districts are are ot's don't always get to call the shots um and um but if if you could find some families um some parents who would be interested in their children learning handwriting and get a, a teacher interested in um starting a handwriting club who would then be interested in getting the ot to um uh, work with the teacher on handwriting, that might be the way to go. Um, I, I think, I mean, maybe you could try going that way with it. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, one more question. I work with older individuals. Are the apps that were suggested user-friendly? Also, do you have any um, recommendations for national organizations that could potentially help? Some may have grandkids that are related to the subject. So the apps that I've recommended that are um, especially um, useful for um, older students, I use Google Keep. Um, Notability is good. Um, Read and Write Gold. Um, it's a whole um, suite of, um, uh, it's a huge um, suite of um, things. And that, it can start um, at the lower grades, but it goes up to the college level. Um, 
and um, Sonicent Audio is definitely for older um, students. The um, Symphony Smart Pen uh, works uh, for adults, um, up you know, so beyond school. Um, and I would say if you looked at that, um, the list from understood.org, that, um, and you click on that link, they outline all of those. They'll give you the specifics on each one of those. Um, and it'll give you a real good idea if those would be useful. And Angela, what was the question about um, national organizations? Yeah, do you have any suggestions for any other national organizations that could potentially help in this realm? Um, I assume maybe like AOTA would be a good place for occupational therapists. Um, I'm not sure specifically okay. what each person's in but yeah, so um, um, there's rights law, W-R-I-G-H-T-S is um, a good one for, it's all special ed um, related. Um, I recommend Kathy Giordano <laughs> at, the, at the Toronto <laughs> organization. Um, and then, um, yeah, um, AOTA, obviously, um, and oh, I just lost my train of thought. Ay, 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 ay. Um, Understood.org is is very good. Um, oh, um, Mary Benbow has a for handwriting, and I can't remember the name of her um, link. But um, those are those are some. Uh, if I think of others, I can shoot it to you, Angela. Perfect, okay, sounds good. Alrighty, well, that looks like all the questions that we have. Um, thank you so much again, Marjorie, for such a great presentation. Um, once the webinar is closed, for everyone still on, you will receive a survey in the presentation. We greatly appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. The survey is specific to your experience during the webinar and will help us to improve future programming. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours that has a link to view the recording of the webinar and also will include additional instructions on how to claim your CE credit if you are interested in doing so. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the TEA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for any other ideas and suggestions that you may have. On behalf of the TRED Association, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Thank you, Margie, and thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great evening. Thank you.